Okay. So, vamos a empezar. Hola, bienvenidos. Mi nombre es Itlali. Mis pronombres son ella y estaré interpretando con Angie, mi pareja de interpretación. Hi, welcome. My name is Itlali. I'm here with my interpret my interpreting partner Angie. Our pronouns are she, her. Interpretación del lenguaje de señas americano también está disponible por Susan y Marianne. American Sign Language Interpretation is also available by Susan and Marianne. La justicia del lenguaje incluye un compromiso a la plena presencia de todos y nuestra capacidad de comunicarnos en nuestros idiomas. Quisiera comenzar reconociendo todos los idiomas aquí presentes, al igual que los idiomas de los pueblos indígenas de esta tierra. Angie y yo estamos en Los Ángeles, en territorio Tongva, no cedido donde el pueblo e idioma Tongva sigue en resistencia. Language justice includes a commitment to everyone's full presence and capacity to communicate in our languages. I want to begin by acknowledging all the languages here today, as well as the languages of the indigenous people of this land. Angie and I are in Los Angeles, on unceded Tongva territory, where the Tongva people and language continue in resistance. Hoy se usará ambos inglés y español activamente, así que las personas que prefieren participar en un solo idioma eligerán un canal pronto. Today, both English and Spanish will be actively used, so those who prefer to participate in one language will choose the channel shortly. Estaremos usando la función de interpretación de Zoom que ustedes han usado antes. Activaremos la interpretación en un minuto, pero antes repasaremos cómo usar la tecnología. We'll be using the Zoom interpreting function, which you may have used already. We'll activate interpreting in a minute, but before, we'll go over how to use the tech. Para usar la interpretación como recordatorio, hará clic en el mundito o en más para acceder a la herramienta de interpretación según el aparato que usa. As a reminder, you'll click either the globe if you're joining via computer or more if you're joining via smartphone or tablet to access the interpreting tool depending on the device you're using. Si tiene algún problema, favor de comunicarse con Ivonne, la, coordina la coordinadora de logísticas. If you have any trouble, please contact the logistics coordinator, Yvonne. Um, Yvonne, y si puede prender la función de interpretación solo para Angie, por favor. Yvonne, if you can uh, activate the interpretation just for Okay. Um, Ahora estoy hablando en, en español y la intérprete está interpretando al inglés. Por favor, levante el pulgar si puede escuchar el intérprete en el canal de inglés. Ok. Now I'm speaking in English and the interpreter is interpreting into Spanish. Please give me a thumbs up if you can hear the interpreter on the Spanish channel. Okay. Usaremos interpretación simultánea para el resto de este anuncio. Ahora usted debe estar en el canal de idioma que prefiere. Dos recordatorios rápidos. Si usa un canal de idioma, por favor, hable en este idioma. Usted puede pulsar silenciar audio original si prefiere no escuchar al hablante original. Hablemos brevemente de las mejores prácticas para la comunicación remota. Por favor, silencie el micrófono cuando no esté hablando. Solo una persona hable a la vez. Esté atente a la comunicación de los intérpretes y facilitadores. Hable a un ritmo moderado y haga pausas con frecuencia. Acuérdese de respirar. Hable a buen volumen para que podamos escuchar todo lo que tiene que decir. Diga su nombre antes de hablar. No cambie el idioma a mitad de la oración. Y finalmente, las personas escuchando en español habrán notado que estamos usando la terminación E en vez de la tradicional A o U. Por, por ejemplo, cuando dijimos bienvenides, no es un error de pronunciación, sino un esfuerzo intencional para crear espacios inclusivos, 
donde no hacemos presunciones acerca de la identidad de género de las personas. Si usted no puede escuchar la intérprete, por favor, use la caja de chat o contacte a Iván, la coordinadora de logística, para obtener ayuda. Muchas gracias por hacer posible que podamos estar hoy aquí. Y ahora le voy a pedir a Iván que me convierta a intérprete número 2, así, este así este evento pueda comenzar oficialmente. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the inaugural um, panel of the Municipal, Municipalism Learning Series. It is my pleasure today um, to be one of the moderators. My name is Francisco Perez. I'm the director of the Center for Popular Economics. Uh, and we're here today because we are living in a municipalist moment. Um, we are experiencing a movement to gain democratic control of cities and towns uh, from Los Angeles to Barcelona to Jackson, Mississippi. People are crafting municipalist platforms, reclaiming the right to the city and self-organizing as rebel cities. Um, the Municipalism Learning Series will convene panels every quarter. So you can expect um, another one in September. We will focus on municipalist platforms in Europe. Uh, future topics will include indigenous municipalism, labor and municipalism, popular assemblies, and Just Transition. Uh, to learn more, please sign up for our mailing list to be apprised of future panels at municipalism.org. Um, today's agenda, uh, we just went over language justice. Uh, again, it'll be my pleasure to introduce our panel in this event. Uh, we will move quickly to our, the presentation by our panelists. Uh, they will each have a few minutes to present uh, and then have some time to respond to one another. Uh, and then we will close. So uh, we're, we don't have much time today. So each of the, these people, um, as many of you know, are wonderful, amazing folks who've done a lot of work, but I will keep the introductions brief. Um, first, um, we will be introducing Ruth Wilson Gilmore, uh, one of the leading prison abolitionists in the United States. Uh, she is a director for the Center for Place, Culture and Politics, and a professor of geography and earth and environmental studies at the City University of New York. Uh, Kali Akuno is a co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson. Cooperation Jackson is an emerging vehicle for sustainable community development, economic democracy, and community ownership in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, Ananya Roy is a scholar of international development and global urbanism. She is the Meyer and Renee Luskin Chair in Inequality and Democracy at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. And Abdul Malik Simone is a senior professorial fellow at the Urban Institute, University of Sheffield. He works on issues of spatial composition in extended urban regions, the production of everyday life for urban majorities in the global south, infrastructural imaginaries, collective effect, global blackness, and histories of the present for Muslim working classes. So we don't have much time today, so I will launch into our very first question, uh, which is, you know, we're here on a panel about municipalism, uh, but it's something that many people don't know much about. It is a global, nascent global social movement uh, aiming to democratically transform the local state and economy. So the first question to our wonderful panel is, how would you define municipalism and how does your work speak to it? Does anyone want to start? So how would you define municipalism and how do you feel your work speaks to it? I, I think I can give it a crack. This is Kali Akuno uh, with Cooperation Jackson, he, him. <clears throat> Pronouns and things said with love and respect. Um, here in uh, Mega Eversville, because uh, we want to erase the stain um, of being associated with one Andrew Jackson, uh, infamous um, enslaver of people of African descent uh, and uh, genocidal maniac of people of, of uh, indigenous 
uh, descent. So that's a long-term project, which is one uh, which helps to shape and define a new kind of phase or era within our own municipal uh, project and orientation. Um, so just wanted to give you know folks a, a a little bit of a grounding there, and just to also know you know we are where I'm situated now uh, is uh, unceded Choctaw uh, territory, uh, and part of our work, if I may start there, um, is to uh, initiate a long-term program uh, to return this back uh, to indigenous uh, uh, sovereignty and control. Uh, through the democratic principle uh, and democratic practice of opening up to all the peoples who want to be good stewards to the land. Uh, so that's a long-term project and process that we are, are engaged in uh, and building long-term relationships to kind of facilitate that. Uh, for us, we're very clear that to move in that uh, project means uh, the dismantling of the existing uh, nation state and its kind of subdivisions, its, its state subdivisions uh, in this case, uh, uh, the state of Mississippi. Uh, but for us, municipalism starts where, with not just within the confines that exist as is defined, you know, by uh, the city charter or the or the state. Uh, it's fundamentally defined by our own construction and definitions of community, first and foremost, and it's situated in where. Uh, we can exercise uh, power, practical power, uh, through our own organizing efforts at scale, right? Um, and, and for us, you know, we are very kind of clear historically that, uh, number one, we are kind of uh, confined within the logic uh, and the parameters, the social parameters of a global system uh, uh, of capitalism that, that sets constraints and is mediated by uh, the nation states basically that the European settler colonial projects constructed and created uh, and that we are, you know, trying to work our way out of in many respects uh, still to this day. Um, and so for us, we kind of started, uh, those of us uh, uh, who really started to frame this project called the Jackson Cush Plan, we took a kind of a radical municipalist view of where within the, the framework of how we define community Right in this case, it was uh, both defined by people, by history, by legacy, um, and where could we kind of maximize our organizing strength? Given you know uh, we were very clear and explicit around a, a particular kind of political framework, political ideology, and an organizing uh, practice that we wanted to define, and where within that could we build power and then try to extend uh, a a through democratic process, to, through democratic engagement, uh, new systems of relations, new systems of productions, new processes by which we make uh, decisions within our community um, that to the greatest extent possible negate the structures and the processes that have been imposed upon us. So um, that is, is kind of what it means to us in a nutshell. And I'm being brief and abbreviated because we've got a, a little bit of time. Uh, but to understand uh, what we've been, you know, working for and aiming towards, uh, you know, here uh, uh, in Jackson, I think this is a good, you know, summation of it. But one thing I will say, uh, just in conclusion, uh, even though this is kind of where we started, we've always been clear that this is not the end all to be all. Uh, because, we, you know, there's a greater project kind of of encirclement, right, of, of in particularly uh, trying to federate, you know, city to city, region to region. First and foremost, to break the power of capital, to keep it from moving, you know, finding new fields or uneven playing fields to develop and exploit uh, and, and play one group of people off or another or one class uh, of folks. In, you know, when I mean class, I'm talking about different sections of uh, the working class and the peasants in particular and indigenous people play us off each other so that it has the mobility to move, uh, uh, to set new conditions uh, and continue to exploit and pillage and extract from the world. And, and this needs to be a strategy which cuts this off and cuts their ability to move off uh, in our view uh, as a long-term project of what municipalism should be leading to. So I'll stop there for now. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Kali. Um, I also wanted to introduce, this is uh, Lido, um, our, I think our youngest participant today. Um, and you know, so in addition to discussing the definition of municipalism uh, and how our work, how your work speaks to it, uh, we would also love to hear how you think we can decolonize the municipalist movement. Uh, what do you think municipalism looks like in the global south? And first up, I'll turn groups. And then if you have time, we would also love to hear your thoughts on the historic wins we've been witnessing recently in the United States for, for workers um, for the first time in a very long time, such as the unionization effort of Amazon warehouse workers in Staten Island uh, and um, you know, Starbucks workers around the country. So what do you think is, is the relationship between municipalism uh, and labor? So Kali, if you want, you can answer that quickly um, before we move on to the next panelist, uh, or I can move on to, to Ruthie. I would say move on, brother, right now. We, we can come back to some things. For time. All right, great. So we will we will have time for a response. So um, in that case, um, Ruthie, the, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you, comrades, for organizing this wonderful gathering. And thank you, Kali and Ananya and um, Malik for being my comrades uh, putting out Two are many, many participants, some thoughts that I hope people will find fruitful. I came to municipalism with great skepticism. Uh, on the one hand, I could see the power potentially in the ways that we might combine territory resources and boundaries, which is to say, create a situation within which we could uh, work to combine our energy and activity to produce public goods. On the other hand, because municipalism, like any ter territorialized structure, um, requires some kind of boundary to keep things in, that means that those boundaries might become borders and keep things out. There's also the problem, therefore, of exclusion and of depletion. So in particular, in recent years, I came to um, experience a little and admire a great deal the work that people were doing in Barcelona to try to make that territory, that city, a place that was inclusive and made possible um, entire, uh, uh, the entire complement of good living conditions for houseless people, for um, undocumented people, for poor people, and so forth. So Anna Kalau and her comrades um, certainly inspired me. At the same time, again, I had some skepticism that the um, uh, independence movement in Catalonia, which is not by any stretch of the imagination, a left open borders independence movement, although there are significant segments of that movement that are open border left independence movement uh, people, um, just made me worry that were there to be a new border drawn around, let us call it Catalonia, there would be one more, um, uh, 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 problem for people who are long distance migrants of one sort or another that would turn into the kinds of killing forces that we find borders um, consist of everywhere. During the pandemic, however, I got to reflect a lot about whether it should be possible as my comrades in Jackson and, excuse me, in Medgar Eversville and elsewhere have been working so hard to realize that there are things that we can and should be doing from the ground up in a kind of local arena while understanding that making public goods should never be something that is exclusive or bounded by um, uh, killing uh, borders. Making abolition geographies, therefore, 
brought to mind that uh, municipalism, no less than other um, imaginings of how we might live together, um, requires us to think about how freedom is a place. And if freedom is a place, then for me, the abolitionist, abolition is presence, is presence of the sort that Kali was talking about and that I think we will hear about from Ananya and from Malik. And if then abolition is presence, is being present, that means also that abolition is life in rehearsal. So my skepticism uh, went down a little bit and I got to thinking very hard about how it's possible for um, uh, entire ways of life, which is to say abolition geographies, to cohere provisionally within the contours, again, of public goods. Combining territory, land and water resources, money and people to make, to make entire ways of life. So I noodled, I thought for a while about making an argument about the capital of capitalism, New York City, uh, and the idea of how it might be converted into a red metropolis, because that's one of the places where I live. And it's a place also where public sector unions articulate a substantial swath of the workforce. While many people imagine, including people who live here in the city of New York, imagine that New York is merely a gleaming playground of the ultra rich, what it really is, is a vast working class city that again is um, very highly, although certainly not universally unionized, where the possibilities for creating the conditions for a red metropolis, to use Owen Hatherley's lovely phrase, um, ought to be what people are working toward in order to counter by every means possible, the rise and consolidation of what Sam Stein calls the real estate state. Counter that with a worker state. And that would include, of course, stopping new jails. I have about a half a minute left. And so I just want to highlight some of the um, key themes that I hope we'll have a minute to return to uh, briefly, that the kind of municipalism that I understand to be unfolding in various places around the world um, is green, not green capitalist, but green. It is also red. I've already mentioned public sector workers, but also workers whose essential labor is for the public good, such as distribution workers who have had those legendary wins against Amazon, nurses, agriculture and food workers, and others whose vibrant and dynamic connections uh, between local fights give us some view in how to connect, as Kali was talking to us about, the um, necessary international dimension of what we need to um, survive and thrive on this planet. Um, I will stop here and return perhaps to some of these themes if we have time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ruthie, for your comments. Um, there's a lot there to, to learn. Uh, we will be discussing the experience in Barcelona in more detail as part of this learning series. Um, and as a working class New Yorker myself, um, I do love reminding people that the capital of capital still has a work, it's still a working class city. Um, and uh, we are also, you know, while we think that municipalism has a lot of promise, um, you know, also want to explore the potential limits or pitfalls of the municipalist project. So hopefully we'll have time to come back to that today, if not in later sessions. So um, next we'll turn to Ananya. So uh, our questions for today's panel are, 
you know, how would you define municipalism? How would, what does municipalism look like in the global south and for subaltern groups? And what do you think is the relationship between municipalism and organized labor? So thank you, Ananya. Hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here today as part of this panel. I also want to give a shout out to Theo and Martha, who I understand uh, did an opening for the folks who are gathered in person in Los Angeles. So my brief remarks will focus on the moment at hand. And in doing so, I want to think from a very particular post colony, which is the city of angels. In my scholarship, which is in solidarity with poor peoples and abolitionist movements in Los Angeles, I have argued that the moment at hand, particularly the moment of the pandemic, can be understood as emergency urbanism. The long arc of that emergency, one that necessitates an understanding of the US as a post colony, is of course global racial capitalism. So during the pandemic, as unhoused Angelinos died on the streets or in carceral shelters, so the country's most expensive home, originally priced at $500 million, went on the market less than a mile from the university at which I teach, UCLA. But something else happened during the pandemic, and that is the declaration of emergency by the post-colonial state under the sign of public health. My interest in this emergency is the following. To understand whether this has opened up a different relationship between sovereignty, life, and property, especially at the scale that we are calling municipalism. To examine how this opening has been created by insurgent movements, and to consider whether such insurgency reshapes the terms of the never-ending state of emergency that is global racial capitalism. In Los Angeles, property became the insurgent ground of emergency urbanism, with movements occupying vacant homes, demanding rent cancellation, and calling for the commandeering of hotels and their conversion into social housing. So seize the fucking hotels, cancel the damn rent. What is distinctive about emergency urbanism is that entangled with these insurgencies was legal reason. So it turns out that in California, during a public health emergency, political executives, such as the mayors of cities, have the authority to commandeer private property without pre-seizure notice. While mayors did not act on such power, the legal declarations linger as a haunting, gesturing at the possible interruption of familiar enactments of property. Similarly, the various eviction moratoria that were put into place, again under the sign of a public health emergency, signaled a reinscription of the relationship between state power and property, with the courts repeatedly refusing arguments by landlord lobbies that such moratoria undermine their property rights. Now, there's some really complex issues here about the relationship between insurgency and the colonial modalities of public health and law. As a provocation, I'd like to suggest that municipalism entailed grappling with such colonial modalities, or what we might consider the master's tools. Now, the moment that is emergency urbanism has seemingly ended. While social movements spent the pandemic building life-saving infrastructures of mutual aid and solidarity and putting abolition into practice, the political and economic elites spent the pandemic planning a war on the poor, which has now been unleashed in LA and many other liberal US cities, especially on those who stand outside of property citizenship, such as the unhoused. And yet the moment isn't over. So what are the possibilities that linger for a radical municipalism in Los Angeles? A few speculations. First, unlike other cities where municipalism has been mobilized by political parties or by movements that acquired political power, I'm thinking about Puerto Alegre and Barcelona, in Los Angeles, it is a space of rebellion. Radical municipalism will be envisioned and built 
from what Ruthie Gilmore has called forgotten places that contain the seeds of grassroots planning, from the tents of Skid Row to the tenant councils of Boyle Heights. Second, as with the ever inspiring example of Corporation Jackson, such grassroots municipalism will have to fundamentally change the settler capitalist organization of property. It will have to fundamentally challenge the plantation and border logics through which labor systems are organized in US cities. And in doing so, it will have to fundamentally challenge the vast apparatus of policing that undergirds property ownership and labor subordination. It will have to do so at a time when the liberal pledge to defund the police has faded. But that's a good thing because no one believed those liberals anyway. Third and finally, in many contexts, radical municipalism has taken hold in the crucible of neoliberalism, often as a counterpoint to austerity. A different moment is upon us now, one where in the US at least, there's a profusion of federal economic relief funds. California too has overflowing coffers. So what is the role of insurgency in the time of plenty? At the UCLA Luskin Institute in Inequality and Democracy, we're very interested in the socialization of public resources in ensuring their investment in what my comrade Hannah Appel calls reparative public goods, and in making sure that it's an investment in these reparative public goods rather than in geo bribes to global capital. This could be seen as a call to seize the state, but I don't mean it as the winning of electoral campaigns. I mean it as the democratic control and socialization of public resources. And this, of course, is both the challenge and opportunity of radical municipalism. Francisco, back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ananya. That was uh, um, a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, we will be discussing emergency municipalism and the effect of the pandemic on grassroots um, movements for urban democracy. Uh, and you know, we'll use this uh, opportunity to remind you all that this is an event organized by Los Angeles for All. Um, so, you know, uh, we're happy you're learning about what's happening in LA and expect more good things to come. Uh, and then, finally, our our last panelist uh, tonight is uh, Abdul Malik Simone. Uh, so, uh, the floor is yours, Abdul Malik. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Francisco. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, a blessed Eid al-Fitra for, for everyone. Uh, and thank you for all of the work that people have uh, done uh, to make this hour um, something of, of substance. Um, so in, in, in a fundamental sense, municipalism is an abiding sentiment that runs through a vast range of collective actions from the Islamic socialists of Indonesia, the 1920s, the syndicalists of the 1930s, the Ocean Hill Brownsville community control struggles of the 1960s, the Italian autonomia of the 1970s, the South African civics movement of the 1980s, the Brazilian homeless workers movement of the 1990s, to the community wealth experiments of Preston in the UK in the 2000s. It is an abiding sentiment to, in the first instance, query where the resources necessary to sustain life, to reproduce value practices of gathering and being together, where they come from, what they cost in terms of people's labor, how they are apportioned and used, and secondly, to render them as affordances held in common, available to all who share a given territory without prejudice. It is a sentiment that the differences that exist among inhabitants are inseparable, that each brings something vital to the cultivation of the whole, 
and that even with inevitable contestations about who can do what, with whom, under what circumstances, there is an ethos of mutual concern and interdependence. As a uniquely urban phenomenon by definition, municipalism is a practice of governing attuned to the heterogeneity of livelihoods and orientations. And as such is less interested in specifying an overarching set of rules than it is in continuously being attuned to the interactions of the different ways of life that compose the city. Calibrating governance practices to the varied outcomes of these interactions, while at the same time ensuring equal access to the right to exist and to thrive. Municipal, municipalism valorizes the various ways inhabitants create territories of operation. That is the changing spatial arrangements generated through specific practices of navigation that provide some stability and coherence to the fragmented piecemeal affordances of everyday residing about how inhabitants continuously rearrange their relationship with the larger city and to better understand the concrete operations of decision-making, the workings of institutions, including all of the mundane situations and events in which deals are negotiated and consensus attained. Today, municipalism responds particularly to the changing conditions of political articulation of urban politics. So if a younger generation increasingly views the places they come from as irrevocably damaged or inadequate and the horizons of plausible attainment and operation insufficient, where the benefits of citizenship, training, compliance, and civic involvement are considered of little relevance, what then is the, what then is the social glue that ties together different forms of both explicit and tacit collective action against different public spheres, across different public spheres. How does a growing lack of confidence in the capacity and authority of government, the expansion of more improvised and temporary forms of social security, the intensive mobility of individuals across different geographies and identities, how do they all continue to forge increasingly fragmented modes of social authority and valuation? And how does this translate into a complex landscape of various bastions of affiliation from small neighborhood churches, zones ruled by paramilitaries or gangs, squatter settlements, gated communities, which pursue their own forms of accumulation and governance? So in within these increasingly fragmented and segregated urban spaces, what are the concrete or incipient lines of interconnection that maintain spaces of mutual exposure or mutual collaboration? And so in some sense, the municipal, municipal has to consider the way in which efforts to open up urban spaces in which to breathe and operate often entail uncertain collaborations among people in places that don't seemingly go together, that involve tentative, fraught, but sometimes generative experiments with new ways of being together, working out a distribution of effort and affordances as they go along. The agents of change are sometimes not only the political forms which we are, are accustomed, Black thought teaches us that extending considerations beyond traditional forms of sociality and collective mobilization to include something more fleeting, to, some, to include sometimes more fleeting assemblies of force are often necessary in order to recognize how important values endure and justice is materialized. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, my name is Andrew Curley, and I'm going to help us uh, move through the next section of the panel, which is the response. And what we will do at this point is we will proceed in the same order. 
uh, in which the panelists uh, initially spoke and you will have five minutes to respond to something that was said or raised or something that you didn't have an opportunity to um, talk about during the course of your initial remarks. So with that, we'll turn back to Kali Akuno and allow him to, uh, to respond to anything said. So. Yeah, I see that there's a, a question in, in chat that I'll try to respond to that uh, briefly. Um, is there a, a kind of a strategy? Yes. Uh, would I be able to like outline and say that there's like one way to describe it? No. Um, we have um, and can, will continue to draw on you know, um, the best examples and practices that emerge from our own work, our own struggle. That includes uh, learning from the mistakes that we make, and we make plenty of mistakes. Um, you know, and, and uh, assessing those uh, collectively, um, checking in, uh, doing the accountability work. Uh, but we also draw from uh, any and all the example we can we can pull from, you know, from around the world. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been uh, mindful of uh, is how, in some unique ways, uh, uh, we've we've kind of ran some parallel tracks of kind of development uh, with several different struggles. I think the one that has been the most kind of uh, illuminating with all of his contradictions uh, has been that of uh, the experience in Rojava since uh, 2011. One, I pointed out, you know, just because a, a particular phase of the work uh, here in Mega Egg Brazil started around the same time, right? Uh, um, at least the kind of the electoral engagement uh, portion of that work started around the same time. Uh, but, you know, it's very interesting how we both kind of um, circle back around towards uh, the solidarity economy uh, and cooperative development, uh, very particular focus uh, on uh, climate change, uh, 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 ecological questions uh, as a fundamental center of, of what we're trying to do in, in uh, reordering our kind of methods of production and how we relate to the earth. Um, and then the, the, the various questions around um, sex and gender, right? And focusing in on uh, incorporating those in a very central way, looking at reproductive labor, care work in fundamentally different ways. Um, and, you know, um, we stumbled upon these things kind of really through both a combination of study uh, and practice uh, and found, you know, to have some similar sources, but also a variance of sources. So, you know, we kind of got to some of this uh, work, I would say, through kind of our examination and, and many of us uh, going down to Chiapas in the 1990s, in particular, early 2000s, is how many of us kind of stumbled upon many of these practices and started thinking about them in new ways. Um, uh, but I also, you know, just personally uh, had read some of the works of uh, uh, Bookchin, and I didn't really think about it in, in a particular way, you know, as, as one of many things uh, uh, that I study or have studied or digested in many respects, but it was very interesting to see how uh, that had really shaped uh, a lot of the Kurdish uh, uh, thought, um, you know, in this, in this particular phase of, of their movement and struggle and how they had also uh, in their practice come uh, to be very clear about creating not just a Kurdish liberated zone, but try to be as open as possible to including all the different kind of peoples and, and uh, minority groups, you know, uh, uh, in Rojava, and to create a kind of a non-ethnic state, but one that upheld, you know, the the, the principles around self-determination and extracting themselves from both, you know, uh, the domination of the Turkish state, the domination of the Syrian state, the domination of the Iraqi state, um, and I think there's something that I'm bringing all this because I think there's something we're talking about this being a particular kind of municipalist moment, I think there's some things that we need to look at 
uh, about where we are, how we are interpreting this moment on a global level. Because I don't think we got to this place by accident is my point. Uh, I think it's, it's our collective work and experimenting in this particular time and not being overly dogmatic. Uh, which I think has opened us up to exploring a new different, a, a, a cluster of different things, sometimes which, you know, uh, uh, haven't been fully resolved, uh, but deal with uh, uh, what I think many of us are now trying to, to develop uh, in many fundamental ways, what we say by intersectionality, like, you know, how do we combine all of these different uh, points and variances and, and contradictions and deal with them all at the same time to the greatest extent possible. That is the methodology I think we're still learning and exploring rather than saying that there's one that's kind of ready-made or there's a cookie cutter that other folks can follow or pick up. Um, you know, we are always mindful of folks who are looking at Jackson to be like, there's some things that you can pick up and there's probably some things that you couldn't um, because your context is different than mine, right? And so this is a program based upon our particular context and conditions. Uh, but there are general principles that we would say that they might you could pick up on. So that would be the way I would answer that particular question. Thank you. And now turning to Ruthie Wilson Gilmore. All right. Oh, so many interesting things to talk about. Let me um, approach one um, thread of, of resonances. Um, people in the audience might have noticed that all four of us talked in one way or another about territory. And it matters a lot as we think about what literally is the ground on which the kinds of projects we are discussing might stand. I am mindful of the um, exclusions and uh, theft of from that land and of that land from earlier inhabitants, from indigenous inhabitants, from round after round after round, and yet. If we are going to make freedom, it has to be somewhere. So figuring out how the territory becomes part of what coheres for us is crucial. And this territory does not have to be geometrically contiguous. There can be, as Kali was describing in his first set of remarks, um, a kind of uh, archipelago of municipalities that work together or in archipelago as the MST has um, helped uh, over its 38 years of uh, fighting in Brazil to uh, put together quilombo after quilombo and liberated land and liberate after liberated land for people to live on and cultivate and thrive. And this is true then if we think about how the cities of the global south have grown so much through the self-built um, uh, 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 structures of life and play and work that, that um, are the conditions of possibility for all kinds of people. And I was really grateful that uh, Ananya talked about uh, the fact that Forgotten places are not outside of history, but rather in forgotten places, wherever they are, there are things that go on. There are social structures, institutional forms, whatever they might be, that rise and consolidate from time to time because people need them. People make them because people need them. And I'll give three examples in the two minutes I have left. I have learned a lot by studying a place that is a state, not a municipality, but that is the state of Kerala in India. And it's about the size of greater New York, well, 30 million people. So the megalopolis of New York is about the same size. And the fact that Kerala, which has had a left government, communist socialist, communist socialist for a very long time has had a development agenda, not growth, development agenda. Um, I've learned about this uh, in conjunction with my dear friend, Maitri Prasad and others. 
Kerala was one of the places in India during last April's COVID nightmare that had surplus oxygen available that was made um, available to anybody in or near Kerala who needed it. Why did they have surplus oxygen? Because part of the development project was to be able to produce something they might need so that we might think of that as an anticipatory reparative good. Two other ex examples, different kinds of formations. Sikhs also in India also produced a good deal of oxygen during that nightmare of a year ago. And if we look around the world, that faith communities, um, central places have become key for the well-being of long distance migrants who are not members of that faith community, but who uh, participate in the sphere of the ethical commitments that Sikhs have embraced. So that's another example. It's not the answer, it's an example. And the third uh, that I can think of is the Navajo Nation, which the territorially specific area in um, uh, uh, the southwestern part of the continent that I think most of us are on, um, made available COVID vaccinations to everyone in the nation and again, anyone who was nearby. So these are examples of the, the rudiments of municipalism or of self-determination or of making freedom as the place where we can thrive. Thank you. Yes, thank you uh, yeah, for mentioning the Navajo Nation, which I'm a member of. So um, it's uh, definitely good to hear a plug for our self-determination. Um, next, we'll move to uh, Ananya Roy. And uh, we have about 10, less than 10 minutes left, but we each have five minutes to uh, spare for each of you. So just letting you know, we'll kind of go a little bit over the hour probably. I'll be brief, Andrew. So. I wanted to say that um, Ruthie's already highlighted some of the possibilities and tensions around the territorialization um, of freedom. And I wanted to pick up on another tension that I also see in chat and in questions, which I also alluded to in, my, in the last point in my, in my brief comments, which has to do with the role of the state. So I will say that the worldwide municipalist movement as it gets institutionalized and maybe right there is one of the key paradoxes, right? Can you institutionalize radical municipalism? To me, there's an interesting tension between sort of the say the global fearless cities network, which is the face of which is increasingly sort of, you know, charismatic mayors versus the municipalist movement um, as sort of made up of insurgent movements that are connected as poor people's movements have always been connected to one another. And I, yeah, this tension plays, played out in a particular way in Brazil and got institutionalized in the city statute, got institutionalized in participatory budgeting. And those things were radical for a moment, right? And then they became traveling fast policies that were replicated around the world. Um, similarly in Barcelona, the PAR won City Hall. And then there are some interesting possibilities and yet some quite severe limits to what they can do. So this tension is real in Los Angeles as a part of emergency urbanism, as movements insisted on the public acquisition of such things as vacant properties or vacant hotels. I think one of the key tensions was what does democratic slash community control of such resources mean versus the vesting of such things in the institutions of the state, of the settler capitalist state, the police state. And I think that tension is very real Big, and, and, and for me, this is particularly evident in two things that I would say are urgently needed in if we are to imagine and build a radical municipalism in LA, because it's quite clear in LA, it's not going to happen in City Hall, right? Um, one is what does it mean to democratize property and labor? What does it mean to decommodify? 
land. What does it mean to uh, re-establish a non-possessive relationship to land, particularly on stolen Tongva land? Um, and that, I don't think can be, that is not a task that can be vested in the current institutions of the state and yet requires, as I suggested, perhaps a seizing of the state and definitely a socialization of public resources. Right? And the second has to do with the point that Ruthie made about exclusion and borders. That there's been a great deal of optimism about the role of municipalities in contesting militarized nationalism. And yet those efforts in Europe against fortress Europe or the sanctuary cities movement in the US have been quite limited. And part of the limitations is, is of course the necessary reliance on that colonial modality of law. So what then can we do outside the law, which is already an expression of settler capitalism that makes possible these forms of justice and makes possible a real alternative to right wing nationalism and settler capitalist property. Thank you. And finally, Abdul Malik Simone. I mean, first of all, I think the the if there is a municipalist re moment, that in in some ways it has to it's it's its initial responsibility is simply to better understand and acknowledge and engage and address the ways in which people actually inhabit and reside within the territories which are governed by city hall, by regional governments. Um, there's a fund, particularly, I think, particularly across the southern, southern latitudes, there is a, oftentimes a fun, fundamental disconnect between the ways in which uh, a governmental apparatus at a metropolitan level actually sees and understands uh, that which is to be governed and what actually takes place. And this has particularly been, been amplified during the, the, the pandemic time, because in some sense, you know, much of the, 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 the vernacular, the kinds of tools of municipal governance still understands the way in which people are organized in terms of notions of household and neighborhoods and workplaces. And, and yes, there continue to be households as we may understand them and neighborhoods as we may understand them and workplaces as we, we would familiarly understand them. But much of, the, much of the ways in which people actually inhabit the urban spaces have been significantly rearranged. So what is a household? What is, what is a, a immediate sort of community of affiliation? Uh, where is it that people work and under what, what, what circumstances? Much of these have been rearranged from the ground, the ground up. And so to whom are we addressing? Uh, to whom are we attempting to engage? To whom are we trying to incorporate? Um, I think initially what is, what, what is important is, is that municipal actors, policy makers, activists, civil servants um, need to be much more attuned to the way in which everyday life and everyday livelihood and everyday social reproduction um, actually takes actually takes place. And then the question becomes is that where where is it that I reside and under what, what circumstances? Where is the where? Uh, and and what kinds of forces impact upon that where? And also the way in which many residents of cities take it within their own hands to design an everyday life for themselves that takes place across many different kinds of territories, many different kinds of wares, operating under many different kinds of logics and apparatuses of rule. 
And so I think that particularly within the South, that the, the that what it means to be municipal and what is the municipality uh, is itself in the process of being substantially rearranged. And then accordingly, a kind of more expansive sense of what kinds of politics can sustain some kind of collective life uh, in the face of this. Thank you very much. Um, thank you everybody for attending this introductory forum, Ahihat. And um, I think it's appropriate to begin or to end the session with uh, how we say, um, how we begin our sessions in the Navajo language in Diné, Ya'at'e, which is to say it is good and it's good for us to have this conversation and it's the beginning of a, a of these kinds of conversations moving forward, which means that the next panel will be on September 17th this year. Um, and it will be focused on uh, the anniversary of the Occupy Wall Street movement, the 11th anniversary as it is. And a couple of things uh, to mention before we leave, the background uh, graphic or the background picture that you're looking at uh, was done by Caroline, Caroline Woolard. It's an illustration from Caroline Woolard. So we wanted to give credit to that artist for providing this really uh, important, inspiring um, graphic to think about the idea of municipalism as has been discussed by our very uh, wonderful panel. And uh, we wanna extend our thanks to everyone who contributed uh, this today, um, Kali Akuna, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Ananya Roy, Abdik, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Abdu Malik Simone. And um, we are very much appreciative of uh, your wisdom and the things that you have brought forward during this time. Uh, so um, with that, I think that's, uh, unless uh, Francisco or Yvonne want to add anything more, I think that will close up the panel for today. Oh yes, one last thing, please sign up for the mailing list, municipalism.org, spelled M-U-N-I-C-I-P-A-L-I-S-M.org. You can sign up and learn more about the future series.